Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Polly. Welcome back to MGT4520 International Entrepreneurship. Today we are going to talk about global monetary systems. The objectives for today are to understand the financial management tools available to manage exchange rate variations, understand foreign exchange and the foreign exchange market, understand the global capital market, and hopefully by doing this, we can explain the balance of payment concerns and the role of international organizations. Overall today, we're here to learn about the financial exposure in international financial transactions. That brings us to foreign exchange. Now, a foreign exchange is a system of converting a national currency into another country. This might include transferring currency from one country to another. So not only is say you're traveling, for example, in, in the United Kingdom, you might want to exchange currency, say I brought Canadian dollars with me and I need British pounds. So not only within that one country can you exchange currencies, but alternatively, you might need to exchange currencies between countries. So if we were starting a business in say Thailand, we would want to exchange the currency from our home country say British pounds, into the Thai currency. Now, part of this transaction might include deposits, credits, and obviously foreign currency, we have bills of exchange, drafts, letters of credit, traveler's checks, even the use of blockchain technology. So what are foreign exchange markets? They are a platform for foreign transactions with national currencies being bought and sold. Now there's usually three objectives of a foreign exchange market. And the first being transfers purchasing power from one country to another and from one currency to another. The second step would be foreign exchange market provides credit. And lastly, number three, provides hedging facilities by covering export risks. Now, if you're not familiar with the term hedging, hedging is defined as buying or selling an investment to potentially help reduce the risk of loss of an existing position. Let's look at a hedging example. Suppose you purchased 100 shares of XYZ stock at 30 pounds per share in January. Now, due to some sort of event, the stock has now depreciated to 25 pounds per stock. Now, assuming that you don't want to sell the stock for whatever reason, whether it be a taxable event, Maybe you want to hold on to it something long term or you bought it for a friend or possibly even a child as you know a birthday gift. But if you don't want to sell it, there are ways to reduce your exposure to further losses. Now, this is where hedging comes in. Now, to hedge this position, you might consider a protective put strategy. Again, a protective put strategy. And this is purchasing put options on a share for share basis on the same stock. Now, puts, P-U-T-S, are they grant you the right, but not the obligation to sell the stock at a given price within a specified time period. Taking that example a little bit further, so support, suppose you purchased put options sufficient to hedge your existing position with a strike price of 20 pounds. So in this scenario, you would be protected from additional losses below 20 pounds for the duration of owning the put option. Some of the reasons for hedging your stocks or your trading is the over concentration of the stock. And what is that? That is you may have a significant exposure to a specific investment such as a company stock and you want to hedge some of the risk. An alternative reason might be tax implications. You may not want to have a taxable event created by selling your position. Knowing all of this, it brings us to the question, should you hedge your position? And there's a few things you need to consider. The first being the complexity of hedging your position. Now, Typically, hedging your position involves advanced investment vehicles. And to do so, you would need to fully understand and appreciate the hedging instrument to utilize hedging, which at the end of the day still might not be suitable for the position that you are in. The second thing to consider is cost. 
Now, hedging involves additional costs. And if we go back to our original example, we're looking at 30 pound investment that depreciated or, or, or lost five pounds. So it ended up being 25 pounds. Now, if we wanna protect our investment at say 20 pounds, there is an associated cost in order to do, do that. Think of it, if you're putting down a bet, for example, on a football match, right? You're betting Liverpool to beat Manchester United. And then halfway through the game, Manchester United scores two goals and Liverpool has no goals. Well, you might add a second bet in order to try and hedge your first position. And, and your second bet is, well, actually Manchester United is going to win. And then all of a sudden Liverpool scores two, pa or two goals and the game ends in a draw. So again, you have to be careful with your hedging because there is an associative cost and at the end of the day, there is no guarantees. Which brings us to our third point, which is effectiveness. Hedging may not be effective, even if it is implemented as intended by the person hedging the investment. We have two examples here, the first being the airline industry. Consider British Airways, for example. They wanna protect their position in purchasing fuel and they want to protect themselves from fuel becoming more expensive. And so they hedge their interests in protecting themselves from fuel getting more expensive. Now, what happens when fuel actually becomes less expensive? There is no point or no purpose, or actually it's just a waste of money in hedging that bet. Now, there is no guarantees, obviously. You're, you're speculating on what could or could not happen. But this is a prime example of how hedging may actually be not the right thing to do. The second example we have is consider yourself as an investor that purchases a div diversified mutual fund or ETF. Now, for those of you that don't know what a diversified mutual fund is, a mutual fund is a collection of, for example, stocks that are all tied together in one bundle and it performs as a fund. Now, the tricky part about this is you can't isolate different components within the fund. You you either back the fund as a whole or you can't really back it at all. And so if you believe that the components of the fund may be exposed to the risk of loss, you may not be able to easily hedge only those components of the fund. As I said, the fund is a complete, we'll say portfolio of different interests within the fund. It's not singular. It's not like in the first example where we bought a single stock, right? So you have to be careful with the effectiveness because in that case, specific to a mutual fund, you won't be able to identify specifics within it. You won't be able to hedge specifics within it. You would have to hedge the fund as a whole. And that's not realistic. It, it, it's not really going to work. The last part is suitability. Now, hedging just might not make sense for long-term investors. If you are looking at short-term gains, short-term investment, short-term market changes, right? Hedging might be quite valuable to you. But if you're looking at investing over time, and I mean five years, 10 years, 20 years, maybe it's your retirement fund, maybe it's your retirement pension, Hedging against a long-term action might not be that suitable. Another example that I have written here is suppose you purchase a stock with the intention of owning it over the long term. Again, more than a year. After a couple of months, you believe the stock may be exposed to the risk of loss over the short term. Now, hedging that risk exposure may not make sense because the costs that are involved in hedging that bet or hedging that stock, again, if you're gonna own it for five, 10, 15, 20 years, well, it might equal itself out, right? That stock might recover, it might gain, it might grow in the future. So taking out a short-term action or, 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 or taking a short-term reaction might not be suitable for an investment that is going to endure over time. 
when we're looking at global markets and types of exchange, really it falls down into two categories. And we identify them as spot exchange and forward exchange. Now a spot exchange is the immediate delivery or exchange of currency. So it happens in real time. The terms of transaction are established and it takes a day or two to actually transfer the funds. Now the rate of exchange is a spot rate market, which is also called a spot market. Whereas again, number two, the forward exchange. Now this is a transaction between two parties in the future in the domestic currency at the price agreed upon in the contract. This rate of exchange is called the forward exchange rate. Now the market is a foreign market. So exporters and importers are protected against exchange rate fluctuations before the contract is actually fulfilled. Now diving deeper into the foreign exchange market, again, as we grow, as we develop as a society, technology is making global transactions not only possible, but increasingly easy, right? And the different parties that are vested in foreign exchange markets are banks, brokers, also known as Forex or foreign exchange, right? And brokers buy and sell currencies directly for customers and transfers the money internationally. You also have foreign exchange dealers. Now, a foreign exchange dealer is a firm or individual that buys foreign exchange from one party and then sells it to another party. There are many foreign exchange brokers that exist, but here is just a sample of what this website suggests as the nine best Forex brokers. And here you will see companies like IG, Saxo, TD Ameritrade, which is also known as Toronto Dominion Ameritrade, and a new up and comer eToro, which again also deals with copy and crypto trading. It's important to recognize as a micro or small business owner, and here again, we're talking about international entrepreneurship, that there are market trends that exist, right? And a lot of the world is heavily influenced by the United States, one of the most dominant, if not the most dominant economic market in the world. And because of that, many of the transactions that happen globally involve U.S. currency. I'm not sure how many people have traveled here, but often when I travel, the, the common currency that is used is American dollars. It's, it's very widely accepted. And a little example here is a manufacturer in Japan wanting to buy Swiss francs might first buy U.S. dollars to then buy the needed Swiss francs. So American currency is accepted in a lot of different countries, and it, it's often heavily influencing the global economic market. Now, other important currencies to consider are the euro, the British pound, and the yen. The cool thing about foreign exchange is the fact that it's foreign, it's global, it's happening all over the world all the time. And the foreign exchange market is always open. Now there are some primary trading centers and, and a lot of scholars and people believe that London is actually the most important foreign exchange center in the world. Others would include New York, Tokyo, and then some of the smaller trading centers include Frankfurt, Hong Kong, Paris, San Francisco, Singapore, and Sydney. building on the market trends and it kind of reflects in the photos here that we are so technologically connected now in the world that the foreign exchange market acts as one market. It's acting in unison. It's all acting together. Like we said, it never closes. There's no significant differences in exchange rates quoted anywhere in the world, including outside of the primary and secondary centers. Because we're so interconnected, because people have access to the foreign exchange markets, it gives that stability. It allows people to access it at any time, which again helps stabilize some of the foreign exchange currencies. 
So what does this mean for the global entrepreneur? And some of the things that I want you to consider, that I want you to reflect on, is how does it impact the global entrepreneur when you're dealing with foreign currencies? Remember, you're either starting a company in another country or you're migrating to another country or you're taking something that exists in another country and bringing it into your new country. And partly some of the things that you really need to think about are manufacturing in foreign countries, sourcing goods. Where are you getting your goods from? Tourism. Tourism has a significant effect on global economies. And then last but not least, again, hedging, right? Purchasing foreign currencies to protect the company. So that brings us to what is really the global capital market? Remember, global meaning world, capital meaning money, economy. Market is, is a gathering of people. So when we're looking at global capital market, what is it? It's a collection of borrowers and investors. People have access to diverse capital, more investors in supply of funds, but are not limited by that domestic market. This is very important when it comes to investing in emerging markets. Lowers the cost of capital, eliminating the limited liquidity in domestic capital markets. There's a dividend yield, expected capital gains on equity, even interest rate on loans, which is debt, are lower. The access to cheap funding is important, but especially in emerging markets, as I said earlier. Investors can diversify their portfolios, reducing risk from macroeconomic forces, known as systematic risk. Bringing back from one of the first slides that we were discussing was the topic of balance of payments. Now, I know many of you are probably thinking, what is balance of payments? Now, balance of payments measures all international economic transactions between countries. Every single transaction is recorded and classified. At the end of the day, it's very much accounting because the balance sheet, well, it has to be balanced, right? The left column has to equal the right column. And there's no allotment. There's no ability to have error in the counting system, in the macro system. Now, this doesn't mean the micro level, which as stated here is between countries. There are two primary balance of payment transactions. The first being real assets and the second being financial assets. Now, real assets, are an exchange of goods and services for other goods and services through either bartering system or more commonly money. It's interesting because I know in, in, in some of the places that I've been to in the last you know three, four, five years, even back in Canada, the bartering system is becoming more common. Now, governments don't necessarily want this to happen because it's difficult to tax the bartering system. So for example, if I give you, you know, three chickens and you put some shingles on my roof, right? So that's a bartering system. Now, if we're looking at number two, financial assets, now financial assets are an exchange of financial claims, such as stocks, bonds, loans, purchases, or sales for other financial claims or money. The big part there. So real assets are physical things, right? Whereas financial assets are intangible. Okay. They're claims. That's the important thing to differentiate here. Real assets versus financial assets. Real assets are real. That's not to say financial assets are not, but you can touch money. You can touch, you know, the, the, the chickens that you're going to trade. Okay. Whereas financial assets, stocks, bonds, loans, purchases, it's, a, it's often just a sheet of paper. It's a certificate. The balance of payments consists of two major sub accounts. The first being the current account and the second being the capital and financial account. Now there are two minor sub accounts as well. So we have two major sub accounts and two minor sub accounts. The major sub accounts again are current account and the capital and financial account. Whereas the minor sub accounts are the official reserve account and the net errors and omissions account. 
you're not going to have to need the, to know this information absolutely in depth when it comes to your first or second assignment, but this is very important information to know in the background as this deals with how we pay people, right? How we transact with people, real assets and financial assets. So let's look at the current account. Now the current account includes all international economic transactions with income or payment within the year. Everything is recorded, including goods trade, services trade, income, and even current transfers. Now it comes down to, we have a couple of things here, goods trade versus services trade versus income versus current transfers. Now goods trade is the export and import of goods. This is quite honestly, the oldest form of economic activity, right? So if you can, well, you wouldn't be able to remember, but if we're looking at Silk Road, if we're looking at, you know, even the barter system where we're transacting real goods, that is the goods trade. And the whole purpose of this is to have a surplus of exports versus imports. So you wanna be sending more out of the country versus bringing more into the country, because again, if you're exporting, means you're selling. If you're importing, it often means you're buying, right? So a services trade is an export and import of services such as construction, financial, or travel. Income, we're pretty familiar with income, but income, mostly current income from investments made in previous periods, including wages or salaries paid to non-resident workers or subsidiaries out of the country. Current transfers are any financial settlements in change of ownership for real assets or financial items. One-way transfers, gifts, or grants from one country to another. All of these components are very important when it comes to looking at how you're going to transact with other companies, other people, other governments within other countries as a global entrepreneur. Breaking down the capital and financial accounts. Now, a capital account is composed of all the transfers of financial assets and acquisition of non-produced and non-financial assets. So again, all the transfers of financial assets and acquisitions of non-produced and non-financial assets. Whereas a financial account, now this is the largest component of the dual account system consisting of three parts. You have a direct investment, portfolio investment, and other long-term and short-term capital transfers. Each of these financial assets is classified by the degree of control over the particular asset the claim represents, such as in a portfolio investment, the investor has no control. Remember, we talked about that before, when you have multiple stocks or multiple entities within the portfolio, the investor has no control over it at all. Whereas a di direct investment, the investor has some control. So if I invest specifically, if I do a direct investment in British Airways, I'll have a little bit of control over that. Whereas in another instance, when it comes to retirement funds, often retirement funds are mutual funds. They're filled with multiple stocks within the fund, which again, helps diversify the fund. It helps give it a little bit greater stability. So if some of the stocks don't do well, the whole portfolio or the whole investment doesn't flop. So portfolio investment, the investor has very little control over the individual components within the overall investment. Whereas direct investment, you're again, thinking of it, investing directly into that company or directly into that stock. So the investor has some control. Now we also have official reserve account and we have net errors and omissions accounts. The official reserve account is the total currency and metallic reserves, such as gold, held by the official monetary authority of the government of each country, okay? That's important to recognize that it's not just currency, but it's also metallic reserves, such as gold, gold bouillon, okay? Held by the official monetary authority of that government of each country. So in the United States, it's the Federal Reserve. And, and again, um, I believe in Canada is the National Bank of Canada. 
even the UK, in the United Kingdom, they will have their own official monetary authority that holds currency and the metallic reserves. The net errors and emissions account, it's a very small account. Now, it makes sure the it does make sure that the balance of payments is actually in balance. So as much as we're thinking about finance here and as much as we're thinking about global currency and funding, at the end of the day, remember, we still have to balance our books. We still have to make sure that everything zeroes out, equals out. Many of the finance students listening to this session now, including our international business students, might be thinking, well, where does the IMF fit in all of this? And, and the IMF is the International Monetary Fund. And the IMF and the World Bank were established in 1944 after the financial collapse caused by World War II. In 1976, the floating exchange rate was established. And most member countries do make available golden currencies for lending. And a big part of this is to help support other countries that are trying to deal with and, and battling inflation rates and reduce the country's balance of payments deficits. Now, a persistent balance of payment deficit would deplete a country's foreign currency reserves, which leads to loans reducing this deficit and avoiding devaluing its currency. The more a country borrows, the more stringent the IMF regulations become. Some of us will be familiar with countries and some of us might actually be from countries that have had challenges in the past dealing with increasing rises in inflation. And the IMF steps in. Um, there are certain things that, that the country needs to do in order to meet the qualifications of the IMF in order to, to receive some sort of financial injection. Now, the World Bank is officially known as the International Bank of reconstructions and development. Probably why they went with World Bank instead of IBRD. Now the World Bank helps to finance and the rebuilding of emerging markets. It's very important. So the World Bank, the IMF helps everybody. So the International Monetary Fund helps just about everybody. Whereas the World Bank focuses specifically on emerging markets, okay? Now, it raises capital through bonds in the inter international capital market, and the International Development Association loans supplied by wealthier nations. And so here we see with the World Bank, we're trying to help, we're trying to support emerging economies, emerging countries, and we're doing that through wealthier nations, such as the United Kingdom, United States, in order to try and help that uh, prosperous growth to try and help that equity to try and help emerging economies this brings us to trade financing now global expansion largely depends on funding also larger contributions by those countries that can afford it now it does usually take between four to six months in order to raise this capital the availability of capital increases the likelihood of spending which is good for the economy. Outside capital may cause other problems in the venture though. Nothing is ever free. One thing that you could do as a global entrepreneur is bootstrap your financing. And bootstrapping is using personal capital. As I always say, it's important to start with what you need, not with what you want. I did put a link here to the Harvard Business Review on a very interesting topic of bootstrapping with startups. When it comes to taking your company globally, if you can't bootstrap with your own finances, often we turn to our family and friends. And family and friends are actually a common source of capital to go international, especially if it originates from the country you enter. Now, Family and friends are likely to invest in our venture because of the strong network relationship. Remember, our weak networks versus our strong networks. Our strong networks are those that are emotionally tied to us, such as friends and family. So our friends and family are likely to invest in our idea because of that emotional connection. Now, 
The difficulty is it can be very problematic if things go wrong. The other thing to think about too, as it comes to operating the business, when friends and family invest in your idea, sometimes they begin to think that they should have an opinion or they should have a voice in your venture and what you do. So it can be problematic when you do raise funds from family and friends. They do have certain expectations on you and it can come with certain stipulations. The other issue could be is, you know, all of a sudden you have friends and family at your business all the time and you can't actually operate the business because they're taking up space. So it's very important that you carefully consider before taking this type of investment. So if you can't bootstrap your own funds and you don't want to ask your family for it, another option is commercial banks known as debt financing. Now, debt financing typically requires some sort of collateral, some sort of assets that you will stipulate if you do not pay back the loan, the bank or, the, or, or whoever it is that lends the funds will seize your assets. Now, it does require some personal guarantee. Part of this personal guarantee is being able to show that you're worth investing in. And this could be having a good bank account record, good track record, paying bills, right? You're trying to show your legitimacy as a business. Another good thing that you could put up is inventory or equipment. Again, any assets that you can put up as collateral, as a personal guarantee, in order to receive that commercial lending. Now, do remember, those of you that have businesses, having leases and leasing equipment is not the same as owning the equipment. So the bank will look at your business significantly different if you have leases. And the likelihood of you securing that debt financing will drop. Now, there are a few other ways to go about securing some sort of financing and, and a unique and different way when it comes to international business is a letter of credit. Now, a letter of credit, what it is, is a domestic bank requesting an international bank to issue credit based on certain conditions. And here's an example that I have for you. The German company could send a check along with the order or wire transfer the money to the bank of the Chinese company. Now the German manufacturer could not be guaranteed that the component parts will be received. So instead of doing that, the Chinese company could ship the components parts to the German manufacturer along with an invoice for the amount due. So if you can't do the financial transaction right away, again, we see that the Chinese company could send the parts to Germany but along with it, they would send an invoice for the amount that is due. Now, by doing this, the Chinese company could not be assured that payment will be received. This is a bit problematic. I'm not sure if I want to send hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of material without being paid for it. Now, this is where the letter of credit plays an important role. Now, the two companies need to reach an agreement on when the seller i.e. the Chinese company in this case, gets paid and provide that information to the bank of each company. So everything is legitimized, everything is written down, and everything is put on notice. That way, the Chinese company will receive payment and the German company will receive the products that they ordered. One of the growing areas in international foreign exchange right now is cryptocurrency and international trade. The most commonly used cryptocurrency is Bitcoin, right? Digital floating exchange pinned to the US dollar. Unlike gold, there is no underlying physical asset to base the price. So there's nothing backing this up. There's a great article here on investopedia.com. I suggest you taking a look at it. It, has to, it discusses trading Forex Bitcoin and how to actually do it, how it actually works. 
Now, Bitcoin transcends international borders and there is no exchange rate. So two people in different countries on different sides of the world, if they already have Bitcoin, there is no exchange. There is no foreign exchange that they have to, to do because they're both dealing with Bitcoin. So in that case, you get rid of all of the complications and the headaches involved in dealing with foreign currencies. You can also send Bitcoin instantly. There's no failed payments because you have to have the asset in a digital wallet, right? There's no transaction fees and it's a secure record of all transactions. Two articles here, or, or at least, you know, this article deals with can blockchain revolutionize international trade and the top, this little bit here, the top countries trading crypto is USA, India, and Pakistan. Nigeria and Vietnam. It's it's an interesting thought, cryptocurrency and international trade, because it it reduces some of the inefficiencies and the ineffectiveness of having to deal in foreign currencies. Now the trouble is, and again we've seen this in the last month with FTX going bankrupt, which is a crypto was a cryptocurrency. There's nothing physically backing up the asset. So it's something interesting to think about. And, and again, we will discuss in the future and, and it'd be interesting to hear what your thoughts are on the role of cryptocurrency in the, in the future for international trade. Moving back into foreign exchange of currencies, we have several companies that deal in it and not just set, like there's lots of companies that deal in foreign exchange, but here's a highlight reel of, of some of the top companies that do it. Uh, Western Union, Lloyds Bank, Wise. Personally, I use TransferWise. I've had great success with them. It's easy. Uh, I cannot say enough great things about them. Uh, PayPal, on the other hand, charges a little bit more money, so I'm not overly happy with just giving away money when I can use another application or another company to reduce the fees. And that's one of the biggest things that you have to think about when doing foreign uh, transactions when you're dealing in international currencies is what is the cost of exchanging that currency? And right now, again, I, I've I've used TransferWise uh, quite often, and and be the the big part of that is one, it's secure, but two, it's also a very affordable exchange rate, and they don't really charge me much for exchanging the money. Whereas Western Union, I know Western Union charges a lot. You know, sure, they're guaranteeing it, they will get it to you, but there's a substantial cost that is associated with exchanging that currency. Well, that's what we have for global monetary systems. A lot of interesting stuff and a lot of things to think about when it comes to international entrepreneurship and dealing in different countries. Now, many of us here have dealt with different currencies all the time, whether or not we're from different countries and we move to the United Kingdom or whether or not we're traveling, tourists, right? It's important to think about when we're looking at our companies, what's the role of foreign currencies? How are we going to deal in different countries? How are we going to deal here? Right? And so I want you to think about it. International currencies is the next step cryptocurrency. I don't know. It'll be great to hear what you think later on in the week.